Welcome to chapter 27. This is the last chapter that we study in this class. There are more chapters in the book, which you may have discovered, but uh, the scope of our class really is as much fun as it would be to go in. Sometimes I've been able in the past to go into a little uh, the connection between pop music and art music, but we just really don't have time with a 15-week format. So, today we're going to focus on four postmodern composers, Varese, Cage, Adams, and Shaw. And I really like this pop art installation that's on the facade of a very traditional art gallery because it sort of helps us visually see what art is like in a postmodern society. So what is postmodernism? A lot of times, because we think of something that's up to date as being modern, we, it, we get a little bit confused and think, well, isn't modernism now? Well, actually, modernism in art and music happened about 100 years ago. So technically, we are in a postmodern time. And this is an all-inclusive, anything-goes trend in music and art as well. We sort of abandon the idea that history is always progress. There is a blurring of high and low art, and so we just have art culture. And I think a really great example of this, even though I haven't been there yet, I'm looking forward to it, is our new art installation up in Santa Fe called Meow Wolf. And it has a lot of different kinds of art in it and it's also a mystery and it's an attraction for people to go and uh, and it's going to be I'm told it's going to constantly have changes. Uh, globalization of course is very important in we can't have a discussion about art and music in the postmodern era without considering globalization one culture is as important as the next. There's a new agenda for creative music. Each composition must have its own unique form according to the demands and creative urges of the movement. All genres are of equal value and there are non-goal oriented forms and a mix of acoustic and electronic resources. And there's real blurring between art music and pop music, and we've explored a few of these things in blogs. First composer we're going to discuss is Edgard Varese. He was born in 1883 and died in 1965. And we can see a, sort of a pop art portrait of Varese in which he's in a sort of a capsule and he's in a space suit and he has some objects around him that he became known for with his music. He trained as an engineer. His parents wanted him to be an engineer and uh, he was actually estranged from his parents at a very young age. He was sent away at a young age to live with his grandparents, and I believe it had more to do with stress in his parents' relationship than anything, but as a result, he never really adequately bonded with his parents. He was equally interested in music as well as engineering, and the love of music eventually won out, he moved to Paris and studied music with Roussel and Vidor of the Vidor Toccata. He was considered very talented and he immigrated to the U.S. in 1915 in search of a less traditional artistic environment and to flee World War I. He actually was going to enlist in World War I, but he was declared not physically fit enough to be a soldier. 
he really had an extreme modernist um, style reaching forward into the postmodernist age. So he was one of these people that was kind of had one foot in each era. Amérique, 1921, was Barret's first work written in the U.S. And this required a battery of new percussion instruments, including sirens and sleigh bells. In 1931, he wrote a work called Ionization, which was written for a percussion ensemble. And it had elements of melody and harmony that really have just been taken out of the music. And so it's a very interesting work to listen to. I don't have any links in this PowerPoint presentation. It's a long explanation, but it has to do with the fact that I really would like to host it on YouTube. And YouTube started flagging everything that I tried to uh, embed. So for this chapter alone, you will find an index in your learning module along with the PowerPoint. And the, the index is a listening index. And there are some explanations of each of these four composers and at least two links of music by each one. So you can go through after you listen to this lecture and you can explore the music on your own. Of course, MindTap also has uh, listening guides for you to listen to. So these two works were really more modern, modernist style. I'm sorry for the squeak, my dog is playing. <laughs> and then he really stopped composing for a while, kind of around the 1930s. It's almost as if he kind of got as far as he felt like he could go with composition in the modernist style. But what happened in the 1950s was that the ability to record music on magnetic tape became more accessible. And this was invented around 1940, but actually became something that, that a composer like Varese could use in the 1950s. And this piqued his interest again in composing. And this is what I would call his foray into postmodern style. He wrote electronic compositions that experimented with something called music concrète. And um, these are just basically kind of like the first instance of recording sounds of life on magnetic tape. And to us, this seems pretty mundane. I mean, you most of you have a phone that has a recording app on it, and you could just pull out your phone and record anything you want if you hear something out on the street you want to record. But this was a brand new idea back in the 1950s. So he used tape sounds of a siren, a train, an organ, church bells, a human voice, and he strung these together in a what he called a composition, but it's pretty devoid of the regular elements of music that we think of. And all of these sounds are altered or distorted in some creative way. He wrote Poème Electronique to provide music for a multimedia exhibit inside the Philips Radio Corporation Pavilion of the 1958 World's Fair. This World's Fair was in Brussels, Belgium, and we can see the Philips Pavilion on the left here, and it looks pretty radical even to my modern eyes, so I can't imagine what people thought of it when they went to this World's Fair. And we can see on the right the, the actual recording studios where this work was partially created or put together, and we can see this tape recorder. It's huge, it's like room size. And actually, I think it's more complex than that. It may be several tape recorders, but you can really see how far technology has come in such a short time, a little over 50 years, not quite 60 years. So electronic music becomes 
a thing. People can major in electronic music at colleges. And uh, there's a technic technology, uh, a progression of, of technology that stretches all the way back to 1877 when Thomas Edison patented the phonograph <clears throat> and using wax discs to record things. In 1920s, we have radio broadcasts of music. I knew a cellist who was quite elderly when I met her, but she actually played live radio back in the 1920s in Denver, Colorado, in the infancy of radio. 1936, we have the invention of the magnetic tape recorder, although it doesn't really become a mainstream thing for a while. The 1940s and 50s, the synthesizer is invented and perfected. In the 1990s, CDs followed by MP3 and MP4 files, computer music, streaming, and all of the many, many ways that we can package and uh, purvey, sell music files now. And in this picture, we see Danny Elfman, he blends electronic and acoustic sounds in his film scores. Possibly the most um, famous of these would be Batman. So he is a very successful film composer. And sounds and pop music are very important when it comes to electronic music. And sampling the extraction of a small portion of pre-recorded music and then mechanically repeating it over and over. This is something that has been going on now for pretty much a generation. Also scratching where a DJ with more one or more turntables manipulates the needle scratching the vinyl of the record while other pre-recorded sounds loop continually. Some of you may have your own program on your computer at home where you Create your own sound world. Now we get to John Cage, who was born in 1912 and died in 1992. He created the prepared piano, and these are objects inserted into and on the strings of the piano. There is a really nice prepared piano demonstration in the sound files of the Word doc that, that I've attached to this week's lesson. And I really like it because the videography is very up close to the piano and, uh, and you can really see some of the everyday objects that have been inserted between the strings and on top of different parts of the inner workings of a grand piano to create what we call a prepared piano. The leading proponent of chance music really was John Cage. And this is an unpredictable sequence of musical events or sounds. That is chance music. Sometimes it's described as a musical happening, a spontaneous group experience. And it really questions the principles of Western music. In your index, of videos, there is a really great, I call it an interview, although we never really hear the interviewer's voice, uh, this is a great nine minute or so video where you have a chance to really hear what John Cage's ideas are about the basis of sound and the meaning of sound and silence. There is also a link to 4 minutes and 33 seconds, which he wrote in 1952. This work is still considered an avant-garde work by today's standards. I have been to performances of this work, and I guess I should say performance in air quotes, because it consists of three movements of silence. It heightens the listener's awareness of environmental sounds, and, uh, and it really is it doesn't communicate a whole lot of specific ideas or feelings. It kind of questions the whole idea of sharing music live with people. And what is that all about? Some people think it's a little bit of humor. 
and and they perform it as such. The recording I have is it re records it more straight, but often people make fun of how much pianists fuss around before they begin playing. So I've seen it performed where uh, the person looks like they're about ready to start any moment playing, but they keep adjusting the bench, adjusting how things are with the keys, and, uh, and kind of fidgeting basically for four minutes and 33 seconds. There's a couple of works by uh, John Cage, by the way, that are on the sound file as well as the interview. So I think you will really have a better idea of, of what he was about and what his music was about. Minimalism is a style of most postmodern music that takes a very small amount of musical material and repeats it over and over to form a composition. It's used in many different genres. It's used in pop genres, it's used in art music, and just about everything in between. And, and what it, it really is at its roots is incessant repetition of small motives. The material is usually simple, tonal, and consonant, and the steady tempo creates a hypnotic effect. So minimalism almost always has a steady tempo or beat. It says there's no development, but I kind of take issue with that. The, the sounds morph over time. So I would say it's almost like um, it's almost like something that is just gradually evolving. And it's influenced by classical and popular music. The aesthetic is a reaction against complexity and expressive in, in intensity. And it is reducing music to the most essential elements. It focuses on clarity, simplicity, works that don't really need interpretation. And, and three composers who use this are Philip Glass, John Adams, and Steve Reich. So here we have John Adams, who was born in 1947. His music has an eclectic quality. He is famous for a lot of different things that he wrote. One of his operas is Nixon in China. That was written in 1987. And a very popular opera that is performed by opera companies all over the world. He is sometimes termed a post-minimalist, and <clears throat> you can hear in his work uh, a kind of a conflict between classical and popular mediums. In 2003, he received the Pulitzer Prize for his work on the transmigration of souls. He also wrote a second opera in 2005 called Dr. Atomic. His work, Short Ride in a Fast Machine, was written in 1986. It was commissioned by the Pittsburgh Symphony, and it scored for full orchestra and two electronic keyboard synthesizers. It's composed of short motives that overlap each other and change gradually. This quote is by the composer. He was asked to write a fanfare sort of piece. And he really felt like Aaron Copeland had already written one of the best modern fanfares. And he thought it was silly to try to um, do something beyond that. And he ended up being inspired to write this piece because he had a relative that had a super fast car, like a Lamborghini. And he was given a ride in the car. And he was terrified because um, evidently this person wasn't the best driver and they were driving very fast and a little bit recklessly. So, so when you listen to this piece on either through MindTap, because this is inside MindTap, 
<coughs> excuse me, or on YouTube in, in this, with the sound index that I've given you, right off the bat, you hear, I don't think I would, I don't think it's the glockenspiel actually at the very beginning. I think it's the wood block. And the wood block starts right off, bum, 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 bum. And for about the first two or three minutes of the piece, it's right there in your face. It's, um, it's played with a very hard mallet. And, uh, and it kind of right off the bat gives us a little feeling of anxiety. And it's enhanced when you start to notice that the wood block will occasionally, after you get really used to expecting it every beat, Every once in a while, it kind of skips a beat. And, uh, and then you hear also little flourishes by different instruments of the orchestra. And I just played this work for some students this morning in a face-to-face -face class who are doing early music. And about half the class thought it was their favorite out of seven things I played for them. So I hope you enjoy this wonderful piece. Uh, the next person that we're going to talk about is actually the last one. Her name is Caroline Shaw. She was born in 1982. And uh, she's really one of the people that is on the leading edge of creating a new model for classical or art music today. Now, probably more than at the beginning of the semester, you probably understand why I interchange classical music and art music when I talk about it because truly classical music was written between 1750 and 1820. That was the classical era. So I always say art music and I'd like for you to think about the classical music since then as, as being interchangeably art music. She's a freelance violinist and vocalist. She didn't start singing till college. She is a native of Greenville, North Carolina, and she's a singer and composer for Room Full of Teeth, which I think would be a great name for a band, but it's actually a Grammy-winning a cappella ensemble. And there's eight people in the ensemble. Sometimes they engage a drummer, but it's eight singers. And she won the Pulitzer Prize for her partita for eight voices. She lives in New York City and makes her living as a freelance musician and composer. So definitely you may be hearing more about her in the future, but Caroline Shaw. And in Mind Cap, there is a part of the Partita for Eight Voices for you to listen to. And it's very much in this postmodern tradition. The poetry doesn't necessarily make much, if any, sense. The sounds at times is just seems like they're exploring different sounds they can make with their voices. And there's even a part of this um, that is, is just spoken words. And again, the spoken words don't necessarily seem profound. They almost read like, like directions for putting together something in, in my imagination. So Caroline Shaw's piece is is really great and then there's also a tiny desk concert that her acapella group room full of teeth recorded and it's about fences it's about a fence and uh, and this is really fun to see because you can really see them all it's a tiny desk concert for NPR National Public Radio and uh, it's actually one of the more interesting little series that is going on musically with NPR. So you can check it out. Tiny Desk Concert, Room Full of Teeth. So the Partita for Eight Voices has several movements, and movement four is called Pasacalia, which kind of harkens back to the Baroque era. It's a collection of dances, which is a typical Baroque form, or I shouldn't say form, but genre, a dance suite. And a Pasacalia is a dance from the early Baroque era. Shaw is really experimenting with extracting new vocal sounds from her ensemble. 
And there is a deliberate form to this. It's ternary form ABA. And you can decide for yourself whether this is an exploration of new sounds or perhaps a metaphor on modern urban life. This is the end of this particular chapter, which is our last chapter. And I did want to just show you real quickly what the index looks like for chapter 27. So you can see this is something that that you can find in your learning module for this week. And, and you can see descriptions of each of the composers and links to all of the music. And here's the demonstration at the bottom of prepared piano demonstration. So I think you'll really enjoy exploring these things. And, and I hope it enhances your understanding of this last chapter. I'm really glad that we at least touch on a little music from today. But it's also rather frustrating to think about how much music there is out there and how many wonderful people I didn't even mention in this class because this is actually not a summing up of anything. It's rather an introduction to art music for all of you and I hope that you spend the rest of your lives enjoying art music. So thank you very much for your attention today and good luck finishing up all of the things you need to finish at the end of the semester.